man, I love being the pastor of a church of people that are adventurers, kind of people that with like webbed feet, kind of, kind of aquatic animal kind of people like you that could make it to worship today in spite of... Is it still raining? Yes or no? I, I, I haven't been out in a while. I don't know. But I assume when we got, when we got here this morning early, it was just monsooning. And so is it still monsooning or not so much? Kind of subsided a little bit? Well, good. Okay, so maybe, you know, maybe you're not as aquatic as the first service. First service people, man, they're totally aquatic because they had to swim to get into the doors and stuff. Uh, just floating downstream and we ripped, ripped them out of there and stuff. It was crazy. But there's a lot of water in the round. So I, I love to be part of a church of people that are adventurers, people that, that love to go to the next step and love to take... Uh, Love to take this adventure with God, and I just pray today that we help you take another step, and so I, I'm really excited about that. Um, by the way, we have um, growth track happening this afternoon, a 101 class. Every, every month we offer 101, 201, 301, 401. Those are repeating classes. Today, we're starting at 101, so if you missed 101 last month, we'd love for you to come today. It starts at 1245. We have lunch uh, right after this service, and then, um, then we roll right into to, uh, the class at 101. We'll have you out by 2, I promise, so it's a good day. And we have child care and the whole deal. So if you want to stick around, we'd love to have you do that. Well, let's go back to rain. Now, Jesus knew there would be days it would rain a lot. Jesus just knew that. He had a way of knowing things. And one of the things he knew is that in our lives, it would rain sometimes. And this is what Jesus said about rainy days. In Matthew 7, he said, there are wise and foolish people. He said that a wise person builds their house on a rock. And a foolish person builds their house on the sand. And he said that when the storm comes and the rain comes down and the waters come up, that the house that's built on the sand will collapse and great will be the trouble therein. That, man, when, when things around us go bad, when the rains come and they will come, and when the storms come and they will come into your lives, and when, and when the storm hits your relationships and those relationships crumble, man, there is pain and Jesus said, if you'll build your house on a rock, on a rock-solid foundation, that your house would stand. And my hope for you, as we start this series called Rock Solid Relationships, that we'll be able to help you build your life and your relationships on the rock of Jesus Christ. It will build up from Him. We'll go all the way through. And, and in this next four weeks, we're going to talk about different relationships. I want to put a diagram up on the board that will help you see what, this, what it looks like for this deal. We begin at the bottom of this. Uh, this, this relationship deal with God. And today we're going to explore a relationship with God. And I want to, e- each week I'm going to give you a key word to that relationship. Today the key word is covenant. And I'm going to unpack that whole thing for you in just a minute. Next week we're going to talk about your relationship with your spouse. And there's a key word there. You've got to be present to win the prize. I want it is, okay? Um, children, same thing. You must be present to win. I'm going to unpack something each week that's going to help you in these vital relationships. So I want you to come and participate in this series. And my hope, my ambition with the series is that your relationships will grow and get stronger so that your relationships can stand the storms that are going to come. Every relationship that you have will face a storm at some point. So you've got to figure out how you're going to build before the storm hits. If you wait till the storm is here to build, you're going to have a problem, aren't you? And if you build in the wrong spot, can that be a problem? Yeah, Jesus said it would be a real problem, and it's true. So I want to help you get established in your relationships, starting with your relationship with God. Now, we're going to use a signature verse. It's out of Hebrews about this series. And I want you to kind of get your head around this verse. Um, I'll go ahead and frame it up. This verse is about Jesus and what he does for us and a covenant he establishes with us. And so just as you look at this verse, know this is all about Jesus and what he wants to do in our lives. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the concept here is this, is that if you want to follow Jesus, it's not about what you do just for him. It's about what he does for you and through you. That's really where our power is as a Christ follower. That's what it means to be a Christian, is to have God's power unleashed in your life so you can do what God has called you to do. It's not something you do alone. It's not something you just muscle up inside and say, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to work real hard and I'm going to be a Christ follower and be a Christian. And I appreciate your effort, but man, you're going to get all wound up and go nowhere. It's got to come from God and God moving you along. And, and we'll, we'll get into this in the months ahead, but the idea is, is that you 
you simply open your life to God as the beginning and let him begin to do his work in you. And that's how he moves us along. And that's what's important. So this is the key verse that we'll be talking about. This is the key verse about covenant that we're going to build this whole series around. So I want you to kind of be in this verse with me. All right, so rock-solid relationships. Today, your relationship with God. That's where I want to zero in on. That's what I want to focus on because your relationship with God is your primal, meaning it's the first It's the proto-relationship. It's the very first relationship. We were created for an intimate relationship with God. We were created for intimacy with God. Look at how the Bible is structured. The book of Genesis opens up where? In a garden called Eden. And what's happening in Eden? Well, God is walking with, with Adam and Eve. It's a relationship. We were designed for a vital relationship with God. Now, if that's missing in our lives, we feel it. You may not know that you feel it, but you can see the impact of it. You see, here's what goes on. Without this primal relationship in place, our lives crumble down around our ears whether we want them to or not. And some of you are highly successful in your careers. And man, I'm glad for you. Some of you students, man, you're so bright and you're so intelligent, but life still isn't working. And I gotta tell you, it all goes back to this, this first primal proto relationship. This is the most important relationship in your life is your relationship with God because you were designed for this. And if this is missing or shaky or, or non-existent, then you're going to struggle and you're going to struggle in every area of your life. And when the storm comes, your house will wash away. So you can't build anywhere else than on this rock solid relationship with Jesus Christ. It is vital to have this relationship. It's life giving. A relationship with God is life giving. If you try to build relationships without a relationship with God, it's going to be life-sucking. It's non-vital. Vital means life-giving. Well, a relationship with God is life-giving, and it's eternal. Your relationship with God matters because it's not just what happens in this life, but it's what happens after this life. Imagine a million lifetimes worth of living, and that would just be the beginning of eternity. That's a long time. So it's important. It's vital. It's primal this relationship with God. And I want to help you take another step in that relationship today. I want you to become more solid in that relationship. I want you to build on on that idea. And to do that, I want to introduce you to the concept of covenant. Now, honestly, when I started working on this message, I thought, well, I know what covenant is. I got that down. I already know. And I was thinking of a husband and wife standing up here having vows. I thought, that's a covenant. No, it's not a covenant. That's a contract. That's an arrangement. That's a that's, a, that, that, that's two equals agreeing to something. That's different than covenant. Covenant is totally different. Covenant, the closest thing we have in our society, is the last will and testament. And to introduce you to that concept, I thought I'd bring in John Grisham to help us. Okay? Now, John Grisham wrote a book called The Testament. Any of you guys ever read that book, The Testament? I'm not endorsing you read it, although I thought it was really a good book. Okay? If you want to read it, fine. If you don't, fine. Um, I know... Some of you will be like, well, you told us we should read John Grisham. He's not a Christian. I don't know if he is or not. I, don't, I have no idea. Um, I'm just saying it's an interesting book, and he introduces this concept of testament so well that I decided I would let him introduce us to testament in the concept of last will and testament. Okay? So go with me here, and let's, uh, let's hear from John Grisham. This is the chapter one of the testament. He opens up and tells this story about a very rich man who's about to dispose of his wealth. Down to the last day, even the last hour now, I am an old man, lonely and unloved, sick and hurting and tired of living. I'm ready for the hereafter. It has to be better than this. I own the tall glass building in which I sit and 97% of the company housed in it and the land around it half a mile in three directions and the 2,000 people who work here and the other 20,000 who do not And I own the pipeline under the land that brings gas to the building from the fields in Texas. And I own the utility lines that deliver electricity. And I lease the satellite unseen miles above by which I once barked commands to my empire flung far around the world. My assets exceed $11 billion. I own silver in Nevada and copper in Montana and coffee in Kenya and coal in Angola and rubber in Malaysia and natural gas in Texas and crude oil in Indonesia and steel in China. My, own, my company owns companies that produce electricity and make computers and build dams and print paperbacks and broadcast signals to my satellites. I have subsidiaries with divisions in more countries than anyone can find. I once owned all the appropriate toys, the yachts, the jets, the blondes, the home in, homes in Europe, farms in Argentina, an island in the Pacific, thoroughbreds, even a, even a hockey team. But I've grown too old for toys. The money is the root of my misery. I had three families. 
three ex-wives who bore seven children, six of whom are still alive and doing all they can to torment me. To the best of my knowledge, I fathered all seven and buried one. I should say his mother buried him. I was out of the country. I am, an estra I am estranged from all these wives and all the children. They're gathering here today because I'm dying and it's time to divide the money. Mm -hmm, and there's a lot of money. And he goes on and talks about his different kids. And the last one, he winds up with a young man named Ramble, who's 17 or 18. Ramble is ashamed that his father is almost 80. And his father is ashamed that his son has silver beads pierced through his tongue. And he, along with the rest of them, expects me to sign my name on this will and make his life better. As large as my fortune is, the money won't last long among these fools. A dying old man should not hate, but I cannot help it. They're a miserable bunch, all of them. Their mothers hate me, so the children in turn have been taught to hate me too. They are vultures circling with clawed feet, sharp teeth, and hungry eyes, giddy with the anticipation of unlimited cash. The soundness of my mind is of great issue now. They think I have a tumor because I say weird things. I babble on incoherently in meetings and on the phone, and my aides behind my back whisper and nod and think to themselves, yes, it's true, it's the tumor. I made a will two years ago and left everything to the last live-in, who at that time paraded around my apartment in leopard print panties and... And yes, I guess I'm crazy about 20-year-old blondes that have all the curves, but, but she later got the boot. The shredder got the will. I simply got tired. Three years ago, I made a will just for the fun of it and left everything to charities, over 100 of them. I was cursing TJ, my son, one day, and he was cursing me, and I told him about the new will. He and his mother and his siblings hired a bunch of crooked lawyers and ran to court in an attempt to have me committed to an institution for testament, for treatment and evaluation. This was actually smart on the part of their attorneys, because if they had been, if they had, if I'd been judged mentally incompetent, my will would have been void. So they're trying to establish his, his mental capacity today before he signs this next will. The last will I signed gave little money to my children. Josh Stafford prepared it. He's my main lawyer, as always. I shredded it this morning. I'm sitting here to prove to the world that I am of sufficient mental capacity to make a new will. Once it is proved. The disposition of my assets will not be questioned. Directly across from me are three shrinks, one hired by each family. On folded index cards before them, someone has printed their names. Dr. Zadell, Dr. Flo, Dr. Tyson. I study their eyes and faces. Since I'm supposed to appear sane, I must make eye contact. They expect me to be somewhat loony, but I'm about to eat them for lunch. Stafford taps his pencil on a one-inch thick will lying before us. I'm sure the cameras zoom in, zoom in for a close-up, and I'm sure the very sight of the document sends shivers up and down the spines of my children and their mothers scattered throughout my building. They haven't seen the will, nor do they have the right to. A will is a private document revealed only after death. The heirs can only speculate as to what it might contain. My heirs have received hence little lies I've carefully planted. They've been led to believe that the bulk of my estate will somehow be divided fairly among the children with generous gifts to the ex-wives. They know this. They can feel it. And they've been praying fervently for this for weeks, even months. This is life and death for them because they're all in debt. The will lying before me is supposed to make them rich and stop the bickering. Stafford prepared it, and in conversations with their lawyers, he has, with my permission, painted in broad strokes the supposed contents of the will. Each child will receive something in the range of 300 to 500 million would that change your life? Wow. With another 50 million going to each of the three ex-wives. These women were well provided for in the divorces, but that, of course, has been forgotten. And he goes on and talks about the, the grilling he gets from these shrinks and whether, whether and they ask him all about his companies and how much they're worth and 11 and a half billion, and it's pretty incredible. And then Zadell, one of the shrinks, asked him this, do you intend to sign a new will today? Yes, that is my intent. Is that the will lying on the table there before you? It is. Does that will give a substantial portion of your assets to your children? It does. Are you prepared to sign the will at this time? I am. Zadell carefully places his pen on the table, folds his hands thoughtfully, and looks at Stafford. In my opinion, Mr. Felon has sufficient testamentary capacity at this time to dispose of his assets. He pronounces this with great weight, as if my performance had them hanging in limbo. The other two are quick to rush in. I have no doubt as to the soundness of his mind, Flo says to Stafford. He seems incredibly sharp to me. So his mental capacity has been established. And he signs that will. And then, 
by his plan. All those three families and their kids are ushered out of his building. They're supposed to be leaving his building now. And the, the room where they've been gathered, this conference room where they've been gathered, where Mr. Felon had been wheeled in in a wheelchair because he hadn't walked in a year, is empty except for Stafford, his lawyer, and a couple other people. When we are alone, I reach under the edge of my robe and produce an envelope, which I open. I remove, it, I remove, I remove from it three pages of yellow legal paper and place them before me on the table. Only seconds away now, and a faint ripple of fear goes through me. This will take more strength than I've mustered in weeks. Stafford, Durbin, and Sneed stare at the sheets of yellow paper, thoroughly bewildered. This is my testament, I announce, taking a pen. A holographic will, every word written by me just a few hours ago. Dated today and now signed today. I put my name on it again. Stafford is too stunned to react. It revokes all former wills, including the one I signed less than five minutes ago. I refold the papers and place them in the envelope. I grip my teeth and remind myself how badly I want to die. I slide the envelope across the table to Stafford, and at the same instant, I rise from my wheelchair. My legs are shaking. My heart is pounding. Just seconds now, surely I'll be dead before I land. Hey, someone shouts Sneed, I think, but I'm moving away from them. The lame man walks, almost runs past the row of leather chairs, past one of my portraits, a bad one commissioned by a wife, past everything to the sliding doors, which are unlocked. I know this because I rehearsed this just hours ago. Stop, someone yells, and they're moving behind me. No one has seen me walk in a year. I grab the handle and open the door. The air is bitterly cold. I step barefoot onto the narrow terrace, which borders my top floor. Without looking below, I lunge over the railing, and he falls to his death. And his hoped for impact would be that those families would all see him right as he landed there on the concrete. And he had just signed his last will and testament. This is a spoiler alert, this next part. In those three legal pages, he writes a whole new will. And he leaves all $11.5 billion of assets. That's not true. He, he leaves to all those families that were gathered there enough money to pay their debts as of that day. But this will won't be read for another month. But in that last will, in that last testament, he leaves it, the rest of his fortune, probably about $11 billion, to a daughter that no one has ever heard of who's serving as a missionary in Brazil for New Tribes Mission. And the rest of the book is about going to find her and giving her this $11 billion. Man, would that just be crazy if somebody showed up and just handed you, uh, said, you, man, you got to know this is a relative you don't even know you have, and they've left you $11 billion. Tim, would change your life a little bit? Still building cabinets after that? You know, <laughs> maybe not. But man, I'm telling you, it would change your life. It would just rock our world if we got that kind of news that, that we had been left $11 billion. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of power. That's a lot of stuff. And that... This last will and testament is the closest thing in, in American thinking to a covenant. It's as if someone who is so wealthy you almost can't imagine their wealth leaves you everything. That would be life-changing. Jesus said that the kingdom of God was like that, that it's worth everything. And that, God, that God loved us so much that he left us everything we need for life, everything we need to, to have a relationship with God. And God gives all of this to us through his last will and testament, through a covenant made through Jesus Christ. The old part of the Bible, the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, was about covenants that God made with men like Abraham and Noah and Moses, people that he promised things to that he would do. It wasn't things that they could do for God, and it wasn't an arrangement where where God said, I will do this, but you've got to do this. It, it, was, it was a gift. God was giving them gifts. He told Abraham, who was barren, who was very old, and whose wife was barren and very old, hey, I'm going to give you so many children and so many descendants that they're going to look like the stars in the sky or like sand on the seashore. And God would take this barren womb and this old man and we create a nation called Israel. And through that nation... He would have a king arise called David, and he would make a covenant with David. And he said, David, I'm going to bring the Savior of the world through your lineage. An incredible promise. There's nothing, there's nothing that David could do to earn that. It was a gift from God. And then God comes on through, and in, in his timing, 
Jesus Christ was born to Mary and to a man named Joseph. And Jesus Christ ushered in a whole new covenant, a whole new last will and testament. What you've noticed about a last will and testament is that a new one revokes the old one, right? Well, God was revoking the old covenants. He was fulfilling them and revoking them and putting a new covenant in front of us, a covenant he established through Jesus Christ. He sends him to earth, born of a virgin, born in a humble manger. Perfect man that grows up. And you know the stories of Jesus and his healings and, and how he dealt with people and how he loved, how he showed us to love. But then we also know this, that Jesus, the God-man, hung on a cross. He died in your place and my place to make us right with God. That when his blood flowed down that cross, that he was setting us free. When his body was broken, he was healing our wounds. It was a new covenant. And it was a gift. And it's a magnificent gift. It's worth more than $11 billion, way more. When you think about the scope of eternity, how much would it cost you to pay for eternity? You couldn't do it. When you think about a right relationship with God, it's not, it's not anything you could do. The Old Testament often had these laws and rules that people were supposed to follow to be in a right relationship with God. And, and it became very apparent, we're never going to get it right. Never going to happen. So we needed someone to stand in their place. That's why we have this incredible verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only son. That whoever would believe in him, that is whoever would take this last will and testament of God as their own would be saved, would be made right with God and would be given eternal life. Isn't that an incredible promise? Isn't that good news? This is great news that you have this rich relative God who blesses you and offers you this covenant. It says, if you will accept me as your Lord and Savior, I'll make you right with me, and I'll give you a life that lasts forever. And it will be the bedrock. It will be the foundation for all of your other relationships. A right relationship with God makes everything else right. We build on that relationship. We build on this covenant. The key to a right relationship with God is his covenant with us, not what you do or don't do. Some of you are trying so hard to be good people. Man, good for you. I'm glad. But it's not going to save you. What saves us, what makes us right with God, is this covenant. It's this last will and testament of Jesus coming to stand in our place to make us right with God. Now, my hope is that today that you will allow God to bless you through that covenant, that you will allow him to give you this new life. He wants to, and he wants to bring you close as a child of God. He wants to embrace you and love you and grow you and help you live into these promises. And as you do that, as you build your life on this relationship with God, those other relationships begin to work right. The corollary is this, and it's so true. If you build on anything less than God's covenant with you, your entire house is in danger of collapse. You can't build anywhere else and be secure. You can't build anywhere else and have the future that God has dreamed for you and that you hope for. If you try to build anywhere else, it's going to fail. So I'm inviting you to accept this gift. Accept the gift of a rock-solid relationship with God through this covenant with Jesus Christ. That's my hope for you today because that's the place where we build everything. It is the place where all of our relationships flow from is our relationship with God. So pray with me.